I'm Ock Bartlam, and I'm having here with me Keith Bevan from Lancaster University, and we're here at EGU 2018 in Vienna, and we are organizing a session on the first session for EGU on the history of hydrology. And as a part of that, we're doing some interviews with distinguished scientists. So welcome, Keith, Thank you. for this interview. And um, in the coming hour or so, I would like to ask you a number of questions and uh, um, look a little bit back on your career and maybe what you still want to do. So maybe um, to start off with, maybe you can tell us something more about um, how you got interested in hydrology and where you started <laughs> then doing your bachelor <coughs> degree. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting story in that um, I think I got interested in hydrology through an, originally an interest in maps. Okay. And the interest in maps came from being in the Scouts. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't have a choice in that because my father was heavily involved in the Scouts. In fact, okay. he's still involved in the Scouts at the age yeah. of over 90. Wow. Um, so, uh, as I say, I didn't have much of a choice, but yeah. um, I found that I could actually um, visualise the landscape quite easily from, mm -hmm. from a contour map and, yeah. and so on. And so that led to an interest in just how does the landscape work. Yeah. Um, of course, water is a primary driving force yeah. for that. But, but there's, there's an, another thing that I think was quite important, and that was a, a family holiday mm -hmm. when I was about 12. So it was about 1962 or so, 63 yeah. perhaps. Um, and we went on our first youth hostel in trip in the mountains of the Lake District in, in the UK. Yeah, beautiful area. It's a beautiful area, but it rains a lot. Yeah. And we were there in July or August in the school summer holiday, and um, it rained an awful lot. Yeah. Um, it continued to rain. Um, I should say that my mother never went youth hostling again after this, <laughs> this family holiday. Yeah. But um, one day we, we were walking over from um, Grasmere to Borrowdale, which takes you over Green Up Edge. Um, and as we came over the top, the whole of the valley was just flowing with water. Mm -hmm. um, and for a 12 year old, this was quite impressive. Yeah. And, and in fact, it's still the only time I've ever seen 100% overland flow in a catchment mm -hmm. in the whole of my career. Yeah. <laughs> so, real overland for, flow. For real overland flow. Yeah. And, and quite deep in places yeah. as, as well. So, and also, you know, a couple of days later, the river had gone, gone down again. So, because it's, it is quite a flashy area. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so those things, those things got me interested in physical yeah. geography in, in general. Yeah. Um, and I continued that interest at school. Um, we have to specialize in the last years of, of, mm -hmm. of, of high school. Um, and I chose to do maths, physics and geography, okay. which was yeah. the first year that combination was actually possible. Um, it was somewhat frowned upon. The head yeah. of physics came into class and demanded why on earth we wanted to do geography, geography as, and not extra maths. Yeah. Um, I had the temerity to say, well, I was actually wanting to do geography and looking for something to go with it. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> so he never spoke to me again. Okay, yeah. um, but I got to do the, the choices yeah. and, and it was a school where um, it was a, pu um, a public local authority school, but it was a school where you were very much encouraged to go to university. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and the school wanted people to, to get people into Oxford and Cambridge, but mm -hmm. um, my grades were not good enough, shall we really? say. <laughs> okay. um, and in fact, I, I, I did apply to university. I had an interview at uh, Bristol um, with Henry Osmiston, who later became my tutor. At Bristol, and fortunately, he offered me a place, providing I retook geography to get a better grade. Oh. So I don't know what, in, in the space of a short interview, what he he saw yeah. um, as, as, as the potential there. But um, you have to remember that this was a time when places were much more limited. So this yeah. is 1968. I, I started at mm -hmm. Bristol. So the number of people going to university was much smaller. It was about, I think, about 9% in the UK at, yeah. at that time. Yeah. Um, but everything, of course, stems from Henry yeah. 
offering me a, a place. Yeah, Fortunately, I got the grades to, yes. to take up that place in, in yeah. 1968. So that was geography bachelor with honors, or um, it was. An, it, it was, um, and and the advantage of Bristol is that you could end up in the last two years doing only physical geography. Okay. So that's one yeah. of the reasons why I wanted to, yeah. to go there. Although, having said that, um, this was at the time when Bristol was um, like the leader in geography in the UK, mm -hmm. particularly in human geography. So mm -hmm. we had a whole series of lectures in the first year from people like Peter Haggerts and Dave Harvey, Andy Cliff, um, Barry Garner, Mike Chisholm, all yeah. really exciting new stuff in human geography. So yeah. I very nearly became a human geographer. Yes. But at the end of that year, Mike Kirkby, who was at Bristol yeah. at that time, gave a course on um, river and hill slope dynamics. Yeah. And essentially saved me from, yeah. from a fate yeah. of being a human geographer. Who knows? Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so I concentrated on physical geography in the last, last, last couple of years. years then. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so that um, you'd had to do a kind of an honours thesis also at Bristol? Um, yes, a number of different projects. Yeah. I mean, in fact, I did my first hydrological model as, right. a, as a project there because um, part of that sort of quantitative re revolution was teaching students how to program. Right. So. In Fortran? Or? Um, in Algol to start with, yeah, which was a better language than Fortran, but got overwhelmed by Fortran. Mm -hmm. And then the following year, they retaught us in Fortran. Mm -hmm. um, but I took to that quite yeah. easily. It was like a game you could play, yeah. even though it was a very slow game, but because at the time the programs were on paper cards Correct. that had to be punched and fed into the computer. And, and then you came back three hours later to see if you had a compilation error, let alone a runtime error, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah. But um, yes. So one of my projects was to simulate the Lymouth flood in 1952, mm -hmm. um, which actually gave me the first inclination of how important antecedent conditions were yeah. for producing flood runoff. Yeah. Because um, as in many of uh, floods in the UK, prior wetting is, is really important in terms of the discharges you get, and Lymouth was a, a case of yeah. that. Another one of my projects was actually generating random topographies to test Horton's laws. Okay. But on a triangular DTM. Yeah. So that you only had possibilities of three flow directions, yeah. Not, yeah. not the eight or yeah. nine that you have, you have in a square DTM, yeah. which is much more efficient. Yeah. So, uh, so that, would, that would have been 1971, something like that. I was doing, okay. doing that sort of already. Uh, yeah. yeah, kind of pre GIS. Uh, Oh, very, very, very much yeah. pre GIS. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so, after your bachelor degree, you went straight on to do graduate studies in uh, University of East Anglia. Yeah. Why did you go to there? <coughs> and um, um, who, what kind of thesis did you do uh, there? And, okay. and who were your supervisors? What yeah. kind of influences? Um, well, um, there's an interesting story there because um, Mike Kirkby was was still an, um, an important influence at, yeah. at that point, and he he offered me a place to stay at Bristol and do a PhD right. with him. But in the same meeting, he also said it was a really good idea to go elsewhere right. and get a wider range of experience and, and so on and so forth. And would you um, have loved to stay in Bristol? Actually, I would have loved to have stayed in Bristol yeah. as well. Yeah, um, but. Um, I could see the type of project that I would have had to do mm -hmm. in most physical geography yeah. uh, programs, which was a lot of field work. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do modeling. And yeah. modeling was, I wanted to do modeling with a little bit of field work. Mm -hmm. um, I did three days field work for my PhD, yeah. um, collecting samples to do parameter estimations mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, and uh, I knew that at the University of East Anglia, I, I met up with a PhD student who was working at the time doing modelling of hill slopes yeah. and trying to run a field site in Wales, which is at the opposite side of the country from yeah. East Anglia, so a four or five hour drive to, to try and um, uh, monitor a landslide site there mm -hmm. that he was 
And, uh, and the two th he, he said the two things were impossible mm -hmm. to do. But he had set the precedent at East Anglia for this type of work. Um, and at the time, it was the student who applied for a PhD grant, mm -hmm. not the department or the supervisors, yeah. it was the yeah. student who applied. Yeah. You just had to propose a project and get a letter of acceptance um, that the department was willing to take you. Mm -hmm. And then the students were evaluated, yeah. which, which gave the students a certain degree of independence. Yeah, and, yeah. and it didn't really matter if your PhD was... Your, PhD supervisors were competent in the area, which yeah. mine, mine were geomorphologists. The first one was Keith Clayton, okay. um, a well-known UK geomorphologist. Um, and then he went off to be pro vice chancellor or something, and, yeah. and Richard Hay, a fluvial geomorphologist, took yeah. over. But um, they didn't have the expertise in the modelling, yeah. um, which cost me some time in not having advice yes. in that area. But of course, nobody really, very few people had the expertise yeah. in, in the modelling. So you have to charge yourself? Largely, yeah. yes. Um, and, and I started off, so my, I went to do a project in catchment modelling. Mm -hmm. um, and I still had the idea of linking it back to the landscape, um, partly because of Mike's influence again. Um, um, but clearly you had to get the water flows right first. Mm -hmm. So I started out by looking at catchment hydrological models. Mm -hmm. So at that time, so this is 1971, Stanford Watershed model, which was the first yeah. real digital computational model, was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so I started off looking at the literature and um, started counting hydrological models and gave up even then at a count of 100. Yeah, right. And decided that that type of conceptual modeling was not, not really objective. There was just so many choices you could yeah. make. And of course, things aren't any better now <laughs> with all the choices that people will have. Um, I wanted to be more objective and more yeah. scientific, yeah. so I decided to do physically based modeling. Mm -hmm. And Al Fries in, yeah. in the States, working for IBM at the time, had already done that yeah. um, for hill slopes and groundwater systems using, um, using finite difference methods. Yeah. But of course, finite differences don't give you hill slope forms. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have hill slopes that looked like hill slopes, so I chose to use finite element yeah. models, which nobody had done for Darcy Richards' equation at the time. Um, towards the end of my thesis, Shlomo Neumann um, published yeah. his partially saturated finite element solution. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually met up with him at a finite element symposium in, in Swansea, where uh, Zienkiewicz was the origin of sort of finite elements was yeah. was professor at the time and mm -hmm. was sort of relieved to find that Shlomo had come up with very similar solutions to the problems of solving the equations that yeah. I had in terms of um, weighting the diagonal of the matrices to, to, to get around some of the nonlinearity issues. Um, so he published a bit before I did, but yeah. um, not as in terms of hill slopes or combinations of hill slopes that gave you Mm -hmm. a, a catchment model. So, so mine was a, a vertical solution in two dimensions, but with variable width, so you could have convergent and divergent okay. hill slopes. Yeah. 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 Were you able to publish something from your PhD out of the um, work? I, I did. Um, um, after East Anglia, I, I moved to, to Leeds to be a postdoc with, with Mike Kirkby again. Yeah. So we got, we got together again. Um, and he had just started up earth surface processes. Yeah. Which still didn't have the landforms at that time. Yeah. It was just earth surface processes. So I got a, I got a paper in volume two, um, but it was only hypothetical simulations about the differences between convergent and divergent yeah. um, land for, um, land hillsides. Um, and the reason was for that was that when I had tried to apply it to a real catchment, which was the East Twin catchment that Mike and Daryl Wayman had, had worked on down in the yeah. depth near Bristol, um, the model just didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it got about 10% of the actual flows being generated. Yeah. Um, and um, so that it took me a long time to complete the, the thesis yeah. and because of that I was still yeah. trying to make it yeah. work and in fact my external examiner on the thesis which was Terence O'Donnell 
um, okay. who became the first professor of hydrology in the UK in at yeah. Lancaster mm -hmm. later. He was still at Imperial College at the time. He said that my last chapter was a gallant attempt to justify something that really hadn't worked very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the last chapter was quite philosophical. Yeah. And trying to explain why this hadn't worked very well. <laughs> but, but negative result. It was a sort of negative result, yeah. yes, but an, an interesting one in that yeah. respect and yeah. because I was trying to do the, you know, yeah. do this objectively and physically and yeah. I'd measured parameters yeah. and so on and so forth and it hadn't produced the right results. Yeah. And, and, and there are good reasons for that. that yeah that later got explained in a paper 25 years later when I did publish the results okay. in 2001. Yeah. And that came about because that was when I got the Dalton Medal from EGU. Yeah. And if you get the medal, you give a lecture and then are expected to write a paper for Hess. Yeah. And I thought, oh, here's a paper that's not going to be refereed. I could actually publish my PhD through <laughs> thesis <laughs> results. It's a negative result. So in well, the end, it, it was published. It was the story of yeah. you know, all the interesting things yeah. that came from, out from yeah. that, which was parameter estimation, uncertainty, preferential flows. Because yeah. if you look back at Darrell Wayman's papers, he actually mm -hmm. says how he walked down the stream in a storm and the water was gashing out here and, and not so much coming out here and then gashing out here again and so yeah. on and so forth. So yeah. the idea of subsurface networks and so on was yeah. there in the data and mm -hmm. totally ignored in, in Darcy well. Richards modelling. Yeah. So, so the failures of that type of Darcy Richards modelling as, yeah. as well, Can obviously, has yeah. been a continuing interest yeah. since. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, that's great. So before we continue on the discussing your, your career early and, and later career. I would like to ask you a few questions more um, who you are as a person. I think it would be interesting <laughs> for a lot of people to understand a little bit better. And um, maybe you can do something with the questions of um, what is your philosophy of life or what, who has been a great inspiration or is still an inspiration for you or basically what keeps you going. Um, yeah, well, those, those are difficult questions. Um, I, I think in terms of philosophy, in respect of the science at least, it's, it's always been just trying to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Trying to understand that modelling process, how that relates to what you can see in the field and what you can measure and so on, and, and, and trying to be um, clear and honest about, about that attempt at understanding. Um, although perhaps not everyone who's read my papers would agree with that that, that clear part, yeah. but uh, um, and that's what keeps me going as well because yeah. we still we still don't have we still have a lack of understanding. Yes, yeah. that's one of the, one of the issues about the uncertainty is to how to represent that lack of understanding, um, and so there's still some real issues to be be solved there, um, and um, I think that. That's interesting philosophically as well because in the many of our sources of understanding arise from you know epistemic uncertainties, lack of knowledge. There's no right answer, mm -hmm. and so that's going to be a, a philosophical issue for, yes. for for quite some time to come. I think yeah. um, um, until we can resolve some of the issues with yeah. better measurement techniques and so on. Um, in terms of important influence, um, certainly Mike Kirkby yeah. early on. Um, since then, uh, George Hornberger at uh, UVA, who yeah. um, we'll cover that yeah. later, yeah. I guess. Yeah. And, and then when I moved to Lancaster, PT Young. Yeah. Um, and just working with students as, mm. as well. Mm. That's always been important. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So in um, uh, from 1974 till 1977, you then worked as a research fellow, I believe, at the University of Leeds. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, Mike Kirkby, meanwhile, I think moved from Bristol to, to Leeds. Leeds. Yeah. And so you worked with him. And I think this is the, the period when um, Top Model was born. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, can you tell us a bit more about your work during that period and also your relationship? And, Work style with Mike. <laughs> um, well, this was a NERC project, um, a Natural Environment Research mm -hmm. Council project, and the idea was to try and understand the processes on a small catchment and then try to model those processes. So I was both running a, uh, a nested catchment experiment um, with the help of a, a field technician um, and trying to do some modeling 
and in the initial stages trying to finish off my thesis as well yeah. and get that model to work. Yeah. Um, but Mike's ideas were to have something simpler yeah. um, and uh, more analytically tractable than, than you know, the, the, fi the, the, the finite element stuff um, took a lot of computer time, particularly yeah. for the computers of that, that day. Yeah. Um, in fact, while I was still a PhD, um, we had a celebration in the PhD room when my model finally broke 12 hours of computer time for 12 hours of real time. <laughs> <laughs> Such was the power of, of yeah. and that was only with you know 200 yeah. elements or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, so, but it was possible. That was what was possible. So yeah. I was quite happy to to go along with Mike that we needed mm -hmm. something yeah. something similar simpler. Um, so we were, we were running the. the Field data sites, and um, and part of that was the idea that this should be a model. We should define this model with a view that it could be run with measured parameters. That you got round some of the problems of model calibration by trying to measure things in the field. Um, although clearly there's issues about how you do that because of all the heterogeneity. I was well aware of already of yeah. preferential flow pathways, yeah. as I've said, and, yeah. and, and so on and so forth. So, um, but uh, we had the idea that this, the topography was going to be important already from Mike's work on East Twin. He had already come up with the idea of the topographic index from the yeah. work on East Twin. Okay. Yeah. So, um, although it wasn't published till about 75, I think, um, uh, the one diagram in the um, in one of the chapters in Hillslope hydrology and also in the hydrograph modeling strategies yeah. chapter that we did earlier. Um, so that was already there. My part of that was to build it into a working hydrological model, if you like, and test it using the data that we had and particularly test it trying to use measured parameters. Yeah. So we did work, for example, looking at sprinkling experiments to get at infiltration rates, but also overland flow velocities, mm -hmm. which turned out to be really slow. Mm -hmm. I was measuring uh, overland flow velocities of between 10 and 30 meters per hour mm -hmm. on some of those grass and rough pastures, upland pasture right. slopes there, which you know, clearly then has, this is not, at the time, that's not what people thought of in yeah. terms of overland yeah. flow velocities. Yeah. Um, if you do it as in terms of roughnesses yeah. and, and, and so on. Um, so it was more like a subsurface flow through the vegetation yeah. that, that yeah. we were looking at. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, the other real um, thing that we did was um, treating the recession curve as yeah. a field measurement to derive model parameters. Yeah. So we, we had the exponential relationships in the basic topographic index approach that depend on a, an assumption of an exponential transversality in the soil, and that gives you a particular form of recession curve. Mm -hmm. And with just three or four measurements on a recession curve, of course, you can derive that parameter, which is one of the most important parameters in that model, and in fact, in most models, mm -hmm. and particularly if you've got a relatively flashy yeah. catch rate. Mm -hmm. um, but we also did things like, you know, top model makes predictions of area of saturated soil. Um, so we had um, both what were called boot tests going out during and after storms, seeing where things were, appeared to be saturated yeah. by just stepping yeah. on the ground. And we also had networks of overland flow detectors. Yeah. I was running 125 overland flow detectors to try and map out the yeah. different situations when during a storm you got uh, um, overland flow or not. Um, and in fact, the, the, it, for that particular catchment, the um, the measurements and the predictions turned out quite well, except that in in the upper part of the catchment there were a couple of um, glacial sand lenses that had been deposited that never saturated. Yeah, um, and from the slopes and the cumulative area, the model would say that they would be saturated, mm -hmm. and that the saturation would quite rapidly go up to a very high ninety five or hundred percent. Um, but these five percent or so of sand lenses, mm -hmm. you know, didn't actually mm -hmm. saturate it. But that that you could at least explain. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, that was published a top model paper. Well, it was eventually. Mm -hmm. um, that's, one, story, one, uh, that's another story. Yes, in the, the original top model paper was rejected by um, Eamon Nash, who was editor of the Journal of Hydrology, yeah. first time yeah. round. Yeah. Um, 
with a very short note and no referee's comments, mm -hmm. saying that um, basically nobody would ever use this. It was yeah. a, the, the phrase I remember, I've never found, found the letter again, but the phrase I remember was that it was of far too local an interest. And, yeah. and that was partly because Eamon Nash was a, an engineer, yeah. a hydrologist, an engineering hydrologist, yeah. um, who couldn't see that this topographic analysis had any bearing on, on what engineering practice, because it just took so damn long, you know. Yeah. It was all being done by hand at that time. It was me drawing lines on contour maps, maps. and working areas yeah. and so on and so forth. And nobody foresaw that 10 years later we would have you know, digital terrain maps and, yeah. and so on, and, and people would just do it with a click on the mouse on a point on the screen. Yeah. Um, that, that wasn't in sight at, at the time. Yeah. And, and it could take me a week to analyse a, a catchment. Yeah. Um, but we did show in, in a, well, that first top model paper then got accepted by Hydrological Sciences Journal yeah. and is now my most cited paper yeah. and Mike's most cited yeah. paper and one of the most cited papers in hydrology, yeah. I think. But uh, it was initially rejected yeah. for good reasons. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But there you go. It's, it's, it's good to know. <laughs> wonderful paper. It's, 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 it's an example I, yes. I, I use, yes, yeah. not, not yeah. for people not to be afraid of yeah. The rejection is just learn from it. Yeah. And so after your period working at Leeds, you moved to the Institute of Hydrology at Wallingford. And I think you worked there from 1978 to 1985 um, with a break where you went to the US to yep. um, uh, work there. So what were the achievements at uh, Wallingford? And then was this um, Another period where there was a lot of development in terms of hydrology in Wallingford. Did you come through? Was yes. And, um, well, I hope so. <laughs> I think so. I was I was actually lucky to get get the position. Yeah. Because the position that was um, initially a short term position um, uh, for a specific grant. Yeah. But, um, and and they, it was a position for a mathematical model. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and they interviewed five mathematicians and me. Wow. Um, and it seemed that um, the, the combination of um, having hydrological knowledge with some mathematical knowledge, um, in the end won out over having lots of mathematical knowledge and not much hydrological knowledge. But I do understand that the, the, the decision was not unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But fortunately, the director, who was Jim McCulloch at, at the yeah. time, um, came down on my side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I got appointed. And, and there were two things that I was worked on in that first period at, um, at Warringford. Um, one was the SHE model, yeah. which was the project that was yeah. funding the position primarily, or mm -hmm. part of the position. Um, and that project was funded by a European loan not a grant, but a European loan okay. at the time, um, which was supposed to be a sort of research into practice type yeah. loan. Um, and there were three partners. One was Wallingford in England. Uh, one was the leading partner was the DHI, yeah. and particularly Mike Abbott, who was working yeah. both at DHI and, and Delft Hydraulics yeah. at the time. And then uh, Jean Conge and Alexander Preissman in Sodrea in France. Yeah. So they were the three partners who mm -hmm. Who, who had the loan. Um, we had a meeting actually before I joined the institute mm -hmm. um, where I pointed out all the problems that the SHE model would, would meet. <laughs> um, but fortunately they would already offered me the job so they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, didn't, they didn't reject me at that yeah. point. <laughs> um, my part of, of that project was to um, code up the evap transpiration yeah, part um, along with all the vegetation parameters, mm -hmm. databases, and so on and so forth, um, and field test data. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I started with analytical test data from just from kinematic planes and so on and yeah. so forth. Um, and by the time I left to go to the states, they still hadn't got the analytical yeah. data working proper, properly. I think nobody properly understood in this the she modeling team, how long it would take to sort out three different Fortran programming styles, right. national yeah. styles, if you like, and put the whole thing all together. Yeah. So it took about 10 years in the end before the first she papers yeah. came out. Came out. Yeah. 
Um, so that, that, was, that was one thing I was working on. And the other was um, a field study okay. um, on the Grendon Underwood catchment, which is near Oxford, mm -hmm. um, comparing um, undertrained fields and non-underdrained fields mm -hmm. on a really heavy clay soil. Mm -hmm. Um, but a cracking clay soil, uh -huh. so preferential flow lines became very important again yeah. because we did some sprinkling experiments that, uh, and tracing experiments that showed that on this very heavy clay soil, um, the time for dye to get from the surface down to the mould range was about 45 seconds. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. On something with a very low conductivity. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so that was also instructive. Yeah. Uh, Mark Robinson took over that. Uh, that site later, but um, also around that time, Peter Gowman, who I did yeah. some of the macropore yeah. work with, mm -hmm. um, he had a postdoctoral research grant from the Swiss National Science mm -hmm. um, Foundation uh, to go abroad, and one of the places that he thought he might go was Wallingford. Yeah. Um, in his application initially, which was to study preferential flows because he'd been working on forest sites in Switzerland where he also had that sort of behaviour, um, to study soil physics and preferential flows, went to the soil physics at Wallingford, section of Wallingford, who wanted nothing to do with it, and eventually it got circulated around and, and ended up on my desk. Yes. Yes. I thought, this is great. You yeah. know, I, I had the experience of yeah. East Twin and Grendon and Crimplebeck and, yeah. and so on and so forth. And, um, and so Peter came over and we started the work together, yeah. including some of those sprinkling experiments at Grendon yeah. and so on. That became a very successful collaboration. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so in, um, in that period, you also went then for a few years to um, the US and um, worked at the University of Virginia, Virginia yeah. with uh, George. I, I'd already, already met George at Wallingford. He had a, yeah. a spell there. Um, okay. And he was chairman of the environmental science department at, at UVA yeah. um, and, and basically invited me to apply for a, a position, they had yes. a tenure track mm -hmm. um, assistant professor pr pr yeah. position that they had available. Um, so, um, so I went over there um, and interviewed, they offered me the job um, and I decided I would take it for the experience. Yeah. And so I told Jim McCulloch, the director of the institute that I was going, and he actually suggested that I should apply for three years leave of absence in case okay. it didn't work out. Yeah, which I did, and that was accepted. Mm -hmm. um, I did think they were encouraging me to go at the yeah. time, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. but he, he claimed later that that was not the case. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so I went off to Virginia for three years and yeah. had a great time um, working with George and other people there, like Jim Galloway. Geochemist and Alan Howard and geomorphologist, and, um, and we were running. <coughs> and this was a time when acid rain work was oh, right. was yes. being heavily, quite heavily funded yeah. as a way of not doing anything about acid rain. So you know, funding the research to yeah. find out. So we were running um, a couple of small catchments there yeah. on the Blue Ridge, fairly close to Charlottesville, where, where UVA is. Um, and, and UVA was um, Mr. Jefferson's university, so it went back with a beautiful campus and so on. So if, if you're going to choose a university in the States to be based at, that, that was certainly one of the best, yeah. just a, a few miles from the Blue Ridge and the, and the Shetland Valley. So yeah. I had a good time there. Um, Did you came back? <clears throat> yes. The, the, um, I made other contacts there as well. That was the first time I started um, collaborating with Eric Wood. Mm -hmm. at Princeton and then um, Siva was one of his research students yeah. at the time as well so we did some work on flood frequency yeah. as, as part of that um, and um, since the university didn't pay summer salary you had an opportunity to go right. elsewhere yeah. for the summer yeah. <clears throat> and, and Virginia is not the best place to be in the summer it's very hot and humid yeah. Um, so I arranged to go and work with the USDA in Fort Collins in Colorado okay. for a couple of summers. Yeah. So with Dave Fort Heiser, Roger Smith, yeah. working on their kinematic wave models. Yeah. Um, in fact, it turns out breaking their kinematic wave models quite frequently mm -hmm. with some of the test data that I had. And in particular, we spent an awful lot of time, I spent an awful lot of time trying to get a two-dimensional kinematic wave model to work mm -hmm. on planes. Yeah. 
<clears throat> without real, realizing that there are really good numerical reasons why that doesn't work because you only got downslope characteristics and if they don't if they don't match if it's not a symmetrical plane yeah. plane you get numerical shocks yeah. developing so I understand that now, yeah. having, yeah. having having tried to understand why this thing really worked out wouldn't yeah. work so yeah. I, had a, I had a good time out in Fort Collins yeah. as well mm -hmm. but yes we decided to come back. Um, I was offered the extension, the normal extension to yeah. the three-year post at UVA, but I also had this three years leave of absence. Yeah. So I had to make a decision yeah. at that yeah. point, and the, it was a difficult decision. Yeah. I think we decided four times. Yeah. Um, but in the end, I think it was my daughter coming up to school age yeah. that um, was the final yeah. factor that we decided we'd rather have her educated in the UK yeah. than in. Yeah. In the US, so yeah. and that's yeah. primarily where we, where we came back. Yeah. And then I had a, a second spell at, at, at yeah. Wellington yeah. For, for three years or yeah. so. And was that back to the um, she model? Or? No, I refused to work on the she model when I came okay. back, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I got assigned um, uh, to Liz Morris, who um, I was in a section of one supervised by Liz Morris, mm -hmm. um, who was um, originally a glaciologist and eventually went to work for the British Antarctic Survey. In fact, she became the first science, female scientist to go down to the Antarctic mm -hmm. with the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and, and, and her interest at, hydro at Wallingford, not really being a hydrologist, the closest thing she could do was snow modelling. Yeah. So she'd been doing snow modelling, um, certainly while I'd been away, um, as part of the Institute of Hydrology Distributed Modelling Initiative, which was separate from SHE, in the same building, but yeah. a separate initiative to do physically based modelling. Um, and so I got I got into put into her section, and um, and basically rewrote the uh, Institute of Hydrology Distributed Modelling. Uh, version 4, which was based on finite elements and was very close to my thesis work, but now much better, with much better numerics and, yeah. and computational abilities that evolved a lot in that, yeah. in that time. Um, and in fact, I, uh, um, when I came back, um, the issue had just installed a mini computer Mm -hmm. Because the their mainframe, but we still had mainframes in those yeah. days. Yeah. Um, the mainframe was overloaded, yeah. and so this was a temporary solution while the research council decided what the future of computing was yeah. going to be. But it had a completely different operating system, so nobody really wanted to swap to a new operating system. So I had this mini computer more or less to myself, yeah. um, which was which was good because um, in Virginia I had a, had access to a big mainframe, the CDC 6600, um, where I'd started doing some of the Monte Carlo work yeah. um, as a way around some of the model calibration problems that people had been meeting. And, and as soon as you st start doing Monte Carlos, particularly if you evaluate things in terms of model efficiencies and so on, you find that there are lots of models that are very, very similar. That was, that was the origins of the equifinality yeah. um, idea. Well, not, not necessarily the idea, because the um, I found some sometime later that I, I actually used equifinality and talked about equifinality in my thesis. Yeah, right. That's part of that philosophical yeah. chapter yes. again. Yeah. Um, but this came up even more once you started to do um, the Monte Carlo experiments. Yeah. Um, so I started running Monte Carlos and also Monte Carlos for weather generation as a view as a, a way of getting a flood frequency characteristic. So from running long series of Data. So in the mid-80s, that was some of the first work that was being done using continuous simulation in, in that way. So um, Pete Eagleson earlier had done work on derived flood frequency distribution, so using physical um, structures with stochastic inputs. Um, my variant on that was to run long sequences of yeah. Of data, so I was doing that on the side from doing the Institute of Hydrology yeah. distributed yeah. model, which is what I was getting paid for. Yeah. Um, but produced some some quite interesting papers, I think. Yeah. But, um, okay. Good. Based on that, and and the start of the uncertainty work as well. Yeah, clearly that, that came in there as well. 
So um, then in, in 85, you moved to Lancaster. Okay. Yes. And um, why did you move to Lancaster? And um, you have stayed along the rest of your career. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, and although you must have had lots of opportunities to maybe make another move, but you were true to <laughs> Lancaster. Um, yes, well, it's a nice place to live. Okay. Um, and a small university, but a, a very good department, um, yeah. originally an environmental sciences department. Um, again, I was invited to apply for a position there yeah. um, by Peter Young, who was head of the department there yeah. at the time, who I'd met while I was still in Virginia. Yeah. Um, and we found we had things in common, because um, one of the things I haven't talked about is, is the work I've done in, in dispersion in, in rivers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I've been doing lots of tracer tests, going all the way back to Crimble Beck, actually, in, in, in Leeds. Um, and Peter's um, transfer function database mechanistic modeling, mm -hmm. um, he had been using on tracer experiments. Um, and come up with this concept of the aggregated dead zone model as an alternative to the advection dispersion right. equation model, um, which is a bit more parsimonious and works just as well, if not better. And particularly, it works better if you've got dead zones in there. So, so we started doing some dead zone dispersion work yeah. together. So I knew that he would be a very stimulating colleague yeah. to work with. So when he invited me to apply for a position at Lancaster, um, I like it in the north of England rather than in the south of England. Yeah. In England it's a bit less crowded and yeah. um, and you can get away into the mountains a lot easier. Yeah. Um, so Lancaster are very close to the Lake District and Yorkshire Dale, so, um, so it's a good reason for, for yeah. living there. Yeah. Um, and yes, I've stayed there ever since, but I've, I've also had the opportunity to take sabbaticals in various places, yeah. um, Santa Barbara, um, Lausanne, uh, Leuven yeah. as well, yeah. and Uppsala. Yeah. Um, so it's a very nice places to visit. So I haven't felt the need to move. Yeah. Um, and, and also, um, I managed to avoid being head of department in Lancaster by one means or another. Mm -hmm. um, the last time it, it took a letter from the King of Sweden inviting me to go to, to Uppsala. Yeah. Um, which some of my colleagues claimed must have been a forgery, but um, <laughs> it got me out of being head of department anyway. Yeah. So that, that was that was quite convenient. Um, so yes, I, yeah. I I've had enough collaborations with elsewhere yeah. and, and been in a relatively yeah. favourable position in Lancaster. I haven't felt the need to move. It's a good place. Yeah, yeah. It still is a good place. Yeah, lots of people. Have it's much bigger now. Yeah. Much bigger now, but it's yeah. uh, but it's a very nice place yeah. to work. Yeah. Okay. Some good colleagues. Yeah. And so, what do you regard as um, uh, achievements that you were able to <coughs> reach? I guess. Um, well, I, I, I guess a lot of the work at Lancaster has been concerned with how do we deal with uncertainties yeah. in hydrological modeling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been a, a, a pervasive yeah. theme. It's something I wrote about earlier than moving to Lancaster. Or some of the, some of it came out at about that about that time. Um, I was sort of pushed in that direction by some of the claims being made for physically based modelling. Yeah. As I said earlier, I'd recognise some of the problems with physically based modelling based on my thesis work that, that when when machine model was being discussed. So when the she models came out, which was in 1986, yeah. um, I actually wrote a, a comment, comment on, those, on those first four papers mm -hmm. for the Journal of Ontrology, because Jim McCulloch, the director of the issue, was also an editor of the Journal yeah. of Hydrology. Right. So I, I, I wrote a comment um, on the papers. It turned out that 25 pages, <laughs> <laughs> but I submitted it anyway. And heard nothing for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, the institute had a vested interest in the machine model. Yeah. So, I, after about six months, I asked, asked you what happened to it, and he said, well, "I'm not sure. I'll look into it." <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's been lost. Um, it's a bit late now. Perhaps you'd like to rewrite it as a paper. Yeah. 
which took a bit of extra time, and that turned into the 1989 Changing Ideas yes. in Hydrology yeah. paper. Yeah. Um, but I felt I had to, rather than just criticising what was being done with the SHE yeah. and other similar models, it wasn't just SHE that I was work commenting on, um, I had to make suggestions about a way forward in the future, and, and one of the suggestions was we really had to be much more realistic about the uncertainties that we were doing. Yeah. Um, and I was fortunate at that time to get a, a research grant um, that um, Andrew Binley, yeah. um, I, I'd worked with him as a PhD student, but he came as a postdoc, okay. um, having finished his PhD. Yeah. Um, and so we we developed some of the Monte Carlo methods applied to yeah. physically based models. In, in fact, the example was the IHDM, yeah. um, showed that it didn't work too well in many cases, but you could find combinations of parameters. Yeah. Um, but our sampling at that time, given again given the computer resource you know, and, and the, the run times of a physically based model, um, was very sparse. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it was quite interesting to go back when we did the glue 20 years on paper yeah. to do much exactly the same model that, yeah. that Andy still had stored away somewhere, yeah. um, but with vastly improved sampling yeah. and, and show what difference that made and different types of evaluation it made and, yeah. and so on and so forth. So, so, but it was much easier to use things like top model for yeah. doing some of the Monte Carlo. So a lot of the Monte Carlo work was, was done with top model and so on. But, but it's, it's, you know, it's always been um, an interesting exploration of, of how, you, how you do this. As I, yeah. as I said earlier, there's no real, whatever some people might claim, particularly yeah. from the Bayesian yeah. side of things, whatever they might claim, because we're dealing with epistemic type of uncertainty, I don't think there is a right answer. So what you get out can depend on what sort of assumptions you're prepared to make. And yeah. um, I know what well, we've shown that you can get rather unrealistic outcomes from traditional statistics approaches to, a, mm -hmm. to doing modeling residual errors and, and, yeah. and so on, particularly when you've got these very long time series and your likelihood surfaces become very peaky. Um, so I've tried to do something a bit different in terms of making some common sense assumptions mm -hmm. initially in terms of efficiency, thresholds and so on, but more recently trying to define limits of acceptability based on what you know about your data before you start running the, the mm -hmm. model. Um, yeah. you, you, you mentioned um, the glue in this um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, respect, and um, I guess that that has been... Um, uh, heavily commented on and uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, getting a lot of critics um, I think um, you were kind of accused of undermining the science indeed publicly uh, at EGU yes. <laughs> by somebody and, I won't mention now yeah. but. <laughs> um, and nevertheless I think you the whole the bringing this uh, uncertainty into the main spotlight has been very very important and how do you look Back to that period now, if you. Um, well, it has been a challenge, of course, yeah. um, including getting things published. Some of our, some of, getting some of our, our work um, published, um, similar to the original top model yeah. paper. Um, but I had a number of papers that, that were rejected. Um, in fact, um, I once had five papers in a row rejected by WRR. Okay. Um, and wrote to the editor asking what the record was yeah. because um, now that I had five in a row I really wanted to go for the record. Yeah. Uh, this was in the days when Sam Colbeck was, was editor and he wrote back uh, very politely and diplomatically yeah. saying well we don't keep statistics of that time no. but we'd be very happy to consider yeah. your next paper and, and yeah. so on. So eventually another, the, the, the next one in fact was accepted so I never okay. got Never got beyond five, and I still don't know if that is the record. But sounds a lot. But, uh, but it, it was quite a lot, and it felt it felt bad at the time because you know it wasn't me. I, I'd reached a stage where you know I, I I sort of understood what was going on and and so on. But you know most of these pa these papers were with postdocs and PhD students, yeah, and it's much sure. more important for yeah. them. I, I I could remember having my first paper, yeah. or actually second paper, rejected. Yeah. Um, and it's quite hard when you're, yeah. you're an early, what we now call an early career scientist, but, but um, when you're just starting off, yeah. it's, it's really quite important. Yeah. But um, 
So, yeah, it, it, it was a struggle at times. And, yeah. of course, some of the, the, the criticism was, was quite harsh. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that can be hard to take as well. Yeah. But you have to believe in what you're doing. And, yeah. you know, as I said earlier, the philosophy is to try and understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you understand what you, if you believe in what you're doing and, and you get a rejection, then, you know, if you think you're right, then you find some way of, of getting the stuff out there and, yeah. and trying to influence yeah. people. Yeah. Because the aim is to make people think. Mm-hmm. You know, think about what they're doing in terms mm-hmm. of, well, initially getting them to think about the uncertainties and not just accept that all your data is perfect, perfect. And, yeah. and, and not to accept that you always estimate conditional on the assumption that the model is perfect. Mm-hmm. You, you've got to think, think more deeply mm-hmm. than that. So. Um, I think it's had the effect of, of getting people to think about yeah. a bit more as well. Yeah. But even at this conference, I've, I've seen some rather unthoughtful applications of, of yeah. uncertainty analysis. And of course, there are quite a few people who claim that blue represents an unthoughtful yeah. representation yeah. of uncertainty analysis. Yeah. But, but that, that controversy will go on for a, yeah. a while longer yet because of, yeah. there is no right answer, yeah. I don't think. But that's... But that's Let's at least use common sense mm-hmm. and not expect to, uh, our models to be better than the, mm-hmm. um, than the, the data w- that we're trying to use to, to calibrate them yeah. and, and drive them yeah. because that, the data is still a real issue. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we're, we're still very much limited by our measurement yeah. techniques. Yeah. Yeah. Strongly. Yeah. But all over, um, it, you have been recognized for all your work, also that part of the work, sure. Yeah. And um, you um, have been come one of the most cited hydrologists, probably of the modern uh, scientific era in terms of hydrology. Uh, received numerous awards from AGU, from EGU, the John Dalton Medal, International Hydrology Prize. Uh, you're a foreign member of the US um, National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the Royal Society of London. Is there any of those awards that uh, you're particularly proud of or that you're thinking? Um, Well, it's always nice to get recognition. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's true. Um, I think probably the one that stands out is is being elected to a fellow of the Royal Society last year. Because I never expected that to happen. I never expected a hydrologist to be a fellow of the Royal Society. Mm-hmm. Um, not in this area. The, the last fellow of the Royal Society who mentions hydrology yes. is in fact Sir Charles Pereira in 1969. Okay. So it's been nearly 50 years yes. since then. Yes. And, and partly, of course, the reason why there's no hydrologist is there's no hydrologist to make the nominations because you have to be a fellow to make the nomination. Um, I mean, that's a great we, we would recognize other, other people who. who have contributed to hydrology as mm-hmm. the fellow of the Royal Society. So Penman was a fellow of the Royal Society, okay. and John Monteith yeah. was a fellow of the Royal Society, but they don't actually mention the hydrological implications of their work yeah. um, in, the, in the material for the Royal Society. Yeah. So it's something I never thought would happen. Yeah. Um, and I, so I feel very fortunate to, yeah. to have had that happen mm-hmm. la- last year. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Okay, that's, that's very. I, very I was good. nominated by a volcanologist, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lacking, lacking other hydrologists. Yeah. 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 And you stayed in the earth sciences field at least. At least, yes. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the committee is a sort of earth and environmental yeah. sciences. So, yeah. and, and the Royal Society is opening. Is trying to open it. It's, yeah. it's access yeah. out much more. It's, yeah. it's in fact in yeah. policy. Mm-hmm. So, if we move a bit more to try to evaluate your career and your successes then. Um, what I would like to ask you is, you have been so unbelievable productive eh, and successful, especially in your papers. Um, is there, do you have an explanation for that? Can you reveal to, to us what you believe is the secret behind your success? Um, perhaps being thoughtful. Um, you know, that goes, goes all the way back to this, trying to understand what's going, going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, having a message 
uh, to get across. Um, you know, I tried to explain to my, my graduate students, when I still had some, um, that you know, in, 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 in presenting a paper, you're usually trying to tell some sort of story. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's good to do that in a way that where the reader is going to be receptive to that story. And so perhaps that's what I've done a lot of storytelling, yeah. perhaps, in, in ways that people can relate to yeah. um, and think um, and, and, and you know, de develop their own uh, views on, on some of those themes in terms of how to do modelling, um, how to worry about uncertainties. Um, and, and perhaps part of this success has also been the fact that um, uh, both Top Model, for example, and Glue yeah. had been readily understandable mm -hmm. to users. Yeah. So and, and have been accessible yeah. to users. So, so fairly early on, we made Top Model available as a. It's yeah. actually open source yeah. code. Open source. We've, yeah. we've made dynamic Top Model available as open source yeah. code. Um, glue methodologies I've made available as open source code as well. So they, they've been fairly accessible to people yeah. and people have, you know, rightly or wrongly, yeah. you know, have, have picked up on them as, as yeah. being relatively easy to use. But maybe and also they, some level of controversy around... Well, that, that helps make people think because... Yeah. Um, and that, um, and when I, for 10 years I taught a, a course on uncertainty estimation in Uppsala. Mm -hmm. Um, and the whole idea there was to get the students to think about different sides of the arguments, mm -hmm. the controversies in terms of uncertainty estimation, read the papers, form their own opinions, and, and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and a lot of them sort of appreciated that, that sort of a, approach. So a bit of controversy is always good for forcing people to make yeah, absolutely. Maybe you think yeah. And yeah. they may not be able to come down on one side or yeah. an, another, and, and and you know in the uncertainty stuff, to some extent, I've continued to do what I've I've been doing um, to provoke the other side. Yeah, <laughs> and keep that controversy going because yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly yeah, yeah that, it does help people yeah. to mm -hmm. just force people to think yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. It makes for sure a science a lot more interesting as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We need them. And, and, and mostly we're still all friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That should be the case. Yeah. Um, so, but besides the success, you must have known also some form of failures or disappointments. Um, can you share some of those? Well, I've already talked about the, the paper rejections, yes. I guess. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's always always a disappointment yeah. because yeah. Um, you always. Think, uh, well, not always, but you, you mostly, for the important papers, you submit them with a view to hoping you know, that they're going to have some impact yeah. and, and, and so on. And then when they're rejected, it's, uh, <laughs> it can be, be hard to take. Now, I've been very lucky in, in my career, I think. I, I haven't had any great, really great uh, yeah. disappointments. Yeah. Um, yeah, some PhD students have both been more um, more challenging. challenging than others, yeah. shall we say? But yeah. then there's a certain satisfaction in getting them through in the yeah. end. Yeah, that's part and, of it. And, um, and I, I, yeah, yeah, that 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 part of it is, mm -hmm. can be challenging yes. as well. Yeah. yeah, you you mentioned students, but you also have worked with many many different researchers uh, from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Did this result in some strong Friends or non influences. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say um, necessarily strong influences in the sense that um, um, more than actually learning from working together. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's yeah. all. That's always a productive yeah. thing to do, and particularly if you're focusing on some sort of field site or another. Mm -hmm. um, because you you learn something from every every type of application, and the list is very long. And I'm very lucky to have your yeah. friends scattered all the way around the world. Yeah. Um, that occasionally, sometimes I catch up with, but um, both my ex students and and, and yeah. others that I've collaborated with, um, some of them are retiring or have retired now, of course. Yeah. But um, um, it's always good to to pick up on those yeah. those again. Yeah. Um, so. Yes, yeah. um, probably um, 
uh, the list is too long to to, to, to mention sure. anybody in particular. I think other than those that I, I've already mentioned. Yeah. And um, in terms of you mentioned several times students uh, uh, and thesis uh, guidance, was that something that um, you particularly liked and um, enjoyed? Um, and has it shaped your research as well, working oh, with those students? Absolutely, yes. Certainly something I've always in, enjoyed. Um, and um, I've, I've had quite a few um, really interesting students to work with. Um, uh, people like Paul Quinn, Jim Freer, mm -hmm. uh, Rob Lamb, Barry Hankin, um, Adrian Kelsey, um, Stuart Franks. Yeah. Um, some of whom I, you know, our, our relationship was was an argumentative one, if you like, but yeah. but uh, um, but uh, you know, always always good yeah. in trying to get that understanding. It goes yeah. goes back again, um, and uh, so yeah, that's something I always enjoyed, learned from, yeah. gained from, um, and uh, some of those are, are still continuing as, as well. Yeah. yeah, good, very good. So when we would, I would like to wrap up a bit um, the whole interview, and there are maybe a few questions um, that could nicely uh, form a closure. Um, I think you're now retired for a few years, two years, three two years. Two years, yeah. Yep. Sort of retired. Sort of retired. My monthly uh, income has gone down. Yes, <laughs> that's part of it. Uh, but I, I guess you still have some plans um, to continue maybe in work and in life. Can you? Tell us a bit more about that. Well, things don't seem to have changed very much, apart from the income. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so this, I'm still involved in in some research projects at Lancaster. I still have an emeritus yeah. position at, at Lancaster. Um, we've got something ongoing at the moment on on natural flood management, which involves all the issues about uncertainty and parameter calibration and so on and so forth. So. Mm -hmm. There are still some things to get sorted there, um, and in particular, uh, we need to do more about some of the input uncertainties and, and, and where our data um, uh, sets might be disinformative in terms of telling you whether you've got a, a good model or not. Um, I think we need to do more about also deciding on whether when models are really fit for purpose. Or not, yeah. or are we just deluding ourselves that these mm -hmm. have predictive, useful predictive capability? So that's that's something else I, I still want to round off before mm -hmm. I properly retire. Um, but then I've always been interested in um, photography as well. Perhaps yes. rather sadly for a hydrologist, I like taking pictures of water. Mm. Um, so um, I have expanding. Um, set of cameras that I can use to continue that yeah. as well. Yeah, and you have exhibitions as well. I've had some exhibitions, yes, yeah. not that many, but um, yeah. um, a recent one this year at the JRC, which um, went down reasonably well, I think. Yeah. So yeah. I've seen some of your pictures; they're pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, certainly something I want to do more. Yeah. more. Well, I'm still mainly as a film film user rather yeah. than, uh, than digital. I yeah. still enjoy that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, if you look back at your whole career and then um, have to um, to choose or to think about um, what is what is what do you believe is your greatest legacy for hydrology? I would hope it would be really making people think yeah. about the modeling process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I try to stir things up, if you yeah. like, in terms of making people think, because certainly when I started off. You know, with, with the earliest Monte Carlo experiments, people were very complacent about just optimizing models and using yeah. them, yeah. whether they were good, whether they were good enough or not. Yeah. You've got the best model you can, you use the best optimization method you can, and then you have to be with it. So yeah. a very engineering type of mm -hmm. approach, and that's that's not a way to do science. Mm -hmm. You learn from that. Yeah. You learn from model rejections, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. um, so I have. You know, I have written about the future when, when yeah. I did retire. I wrote that commentary in hydrological yeah. processes on advice to a young hydrology, so yeah. that can, people can look that up if they, yeah. if they want one more detail on those views. But if I if I've done anything, then I hope I've I've 
help to make people think about what they're, yeah. they're doing. Yeah. And if you would have to start all over again your career, <laughs> it's this kind of hypothetical questions. Um, would it be different? Would you want to have done it differently? Um, I don't. I don't think you. It's, that's a very difficult question to answer yes. because so much is conditional on what you've got available at the time. You know, in, in particular in our case, yes. the whole development of computer yeah. and computational resources. Yeah. You know, perhaps now I'd be doing. Well, I've already made some suggestions about how to do models of everywhere mm -hmm. and some of the issues involved in, in doing that. Yeah. Um, I do think that you know, once we've got models of everywhere, it's going to change the way people do modeling mm -hmm. because you get feedback from users. Mm -hmm. Okay, If you're making predictions and you make them available as visualizations of the web, you know, people say, well, it's, yeah. it's, it's not like that. Yeah. <laughs> And, and that, get, that will get fed back as well as some of the community science and yeah. stuff and so on and so forth. Um, so um, that really is going to change the way we do things. So if we were starting again, you know, the, the whole situation is, is different. You, you, and like, you know, some, there are some people who are starting to do this models very well yeah. now, yeah. Um, not, not necessarily at the earth science yeah. system level, but just at the local level and getting some of those feedbacks and, yeah. and trying to improve the local representations yeah. or not, if you can do so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, so, so yes, it, it will be a different, completely different yeah. situation. Yeah. But you have no regrets. Oh, absolutely, absolutely not, despite all the controversies. Yes, no, 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 that's no, no, been, that's been part, the, part of the fun. Yeah, part of the fun is doing the fun. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, you already just said before that you wrote about the um, future um, um, of science, of hydrology, and advice for younger ones. Mm -hmm. Could you just, as a final closure, um, say something about that. What, what do you think is the future for hydrology? Is there a future? Are we over the top? Um, um, is there a... No, I mean, there has to be a future because hydrological problems are really, really important to society. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how do you do the science to support you know, the evidence that gets used in decision making? Now that you know, decision making is evidence based, I'll certainly say. Yeah. So, I. You know, we can we can improve the science. Um, at the moment, I think we can't improve it that much because we're measurement technique limited still. Yep. Okay. So the last big revolution in hydrology was when everybody started to use not everybody, but we started to use tracer information that showed us that so much of the water coming out was old water and, yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, and that's been refined and refined. So. The interesting thing is what the next revolutionary measurement technique is yeah. going to be. So it's measurements very much. I think we're, we're highly dependent on, on, on measurements. I mean, there, there are interim solutions in modeling. The you know, one I've suggested is this change in the way we do things by having models of everywhere and getting feedback from stakeholders and, 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 and even the public about saying, well, that's ridiculous in my house. Doesn't get flooded like that, yeah. and, and, and so yeah. although you know, obviously you run into vested interest yeah. issues there as well as to what people would actually report, um, but in you know that sort of feedback will help us localize um, model representations, yeah. which is also what we need. But perhaps new measurement techniques. You know some of the work that's been shown this week on Sentinel use of Sentinel, yeah. SAR, and so on and so forth is is moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the one one thing I really haven't seen out of the hydrological modeling community is commissioning new measurement techniques in the same way as you would commission a new satellite. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've mentioned this in a couple of papers, but why haven't we taken through the whole process, which might like last a decade or so, yeah. but define what we need and how are we going to get there? Yeah. And in particular, you know, we don't actually have a means of measuring discharge. Yeah. It's you rather important to us, yeah. but we don't have a means of measuring discharge, and certainly not one that's accurate enough to look at incremental discharges down the catchment yeah. and learn about some of those local responses, even if we just had those discharge increments yeah. downstream. Do you think we are, as a hydrological community, strong enough organized at the moment in terms of commissioning what we actually need for our science? Well, it hasn't happened. 
Um, it hasn't happened in the same way as, say, the meteorological community have yeah. defined the next requirements for the next generation yeah. of models. Yeah. Um, there, there was a sort of subcommittee in pub mm -hmm. that uh, had that responsibility, but yeah. nothing actually came out right. very much. Yeah. There's a subcommittee in Pantaria yeah. that has that sort of responsibility, but I haven't heard too much. I haven't been involved, so I, yeah. but I haven't heard too much of it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's needed. Yeah. Um, we remain measurement technique limited. Mm -hmm. Strong. And you yeah. can't get around that just by modeling. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You need you know, real information. Yeah. Yeah. On that note, mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point to close down this uh, interview. Thank you very much well, for sharing you. your uh, uh, ideas and uh, I hope this will be very useful for the, com for the current and the next generation of hydrologists. You have been fantastic, influential and steering up the community and uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you.